Hello and welcome to the Rugby Show on the 42.ie. We're coming to you live on the eve of the eve of the second Lions test in New Zealand. My own name is Gavin Casey and I'm delighted to be joined from New Zealand by the man himself, Murray Kinsella. Hopefully you can see him there. Murray, how's tricks? Not too bad, I'm hanging in there. Not too long to go now. Um, uh, hopefully a pretty fascinating test match this weekend to get us through into a the final week where we're hopefully going to be 1-1. One, one. It'll be pretty amazing to go to, to Auckland with that uh, series on the line. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I suppose there's there's shades, really, of uh, of a few years back. You know, a 45-man touring squad. We've got uh, a 10-12 axis consisting of two fly halves, 15-point margin of defeat in the first test, and a head coach who doesn't really seem to want to be there. Uh, like, have we woken up in 2005, or what's the story? Yeah, there's definitely echoes here, and I think some of the Kiwi press have been uh, kind of hammering that home a little bit. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. You know, we, we got another weekend to decide that. If they go down this test by a bigger margin again, then, yeah, the knives are going to come out for Warren Gatland. There was a bit of that kind of milling around the place this week. We had those um, unused subs in that match on, on Tuesday night, and uh, I think people were, were sharpening the knives at least. They're not sticking them in quite yet, but it's a, it's a massive game in Warren Gatland's career. Um, and a massive game for the Lions kind of brand overall. There's a lot of kind of gnashing of the teeth over where their future is. And if they take an absolute hammering or a, or a big margin defeat, well, then you have to say they're in a bit of trouble. Yeah, I mean, obviously there are a lot of uh, topics of discussion with regards to team selection, but I think the one to start with is Peter Romani just being axed from the squad altogether. Um, I think it's, it strikes as a little bit harsh, even if his impact on the ground and in open play Last weekend wasn't quite as uh, what he would have hoped himself. I think he made only two carries, 13 tackles. But you mentioned in your piece this morning that four of those tackles at least were, were quite passive. So can you understand where Gatlin is coming from making this decision? You would have imagined maybe he would have at least earned a place on the bench. Yeah, look, Peter Manning is a bit of a scapegoat here. Um, I, I can understand the decision to replace him in the, in the starting team. You mentioned some of the stuff in his game there. He was really strong in the line out. He won five balls for the Lions on their own on their own throw. He stole one from the Kiwis. Um, as you say, he didn't get into the game on the ball. Uh, he, you know, they they push him into those wide channels at times, and he's kind of a peripheral figure when, when they're attacking, even across the other games in this tour as well. So I don't think he had the strongest game. But as you say, like it's a, it's a pretty massive fall from grace, an axing. Um, Warren Gallen felt he had to change things. He had to change some momentum. Um, and by bringing in his tour captain, that's what he that's what he believes he's doing. Sam Warburton ha doesn't have a whole lot of form behind him. Um, Gatlin said he was delighted with how he came off the bench in the first test. And having looked back at it, he did he did make an impact. There was a couple of big dominant tackles. Um, he slowed down the ball twice. It was a pretty short stint, but he showed that he can be competitive at that level. And, and he's done it before for Gatlin. But Gatlin's putting a lot of pressure on his shoulders, you know. Uh, Warburton absolutely has to deliver... Um, a kind of telling impact on this game, a, a game-winning impact. Um, and you have to feel for Peter Romani, going from the ultimate high in his career, where everyone's lauding him, bigging him up to uh, just being this forgotten figure. And even in the press stuff today, uh, it was qu quite brushed over, really. They, they've moved on, and, and Peter Romani, no better man to get stuck in and help out his teammates. And apparently he's been uh, very good since the bad news. He's trained really well today, according to Sean O'Brien. Um, and he was straight over shaking hands with, with Warburton after this decision was announced. But, look, he's a bit of a scapegoat. Gatlin had to change something, and, and Peter O'Mani is the guy to pay the price. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like, Gatlin's, you, you mentioned the, the impact that Warburton had when he came on. Like, uh, that, they were Gatlin's words, actually. Uh, we, we saw the impact that he had. You mentioned uh, Gatlin was delighted with him. And it's interesting hearing that you look over it and, and saw what many others didn't, maybe, at first viewing. But do you reckon this is a straight-up decision between two players based on their their ability on the ground because i suppose gatlin really is is vouching for warburton over omani as a ball winner here and and his ability to slow the ball down which in fairness omani is no slouch at himself no omani has traditionally been really strong in that area i think he suffered a little little bit in the last couple of years in that area um, i think there was a, a referees meeting a number of years ago where he was the player they actually looked at it in relation to guys having their elbows on the ground and stuff and i think these referees they subconsciously maybe remember that kind of stuff whereas warburton is known as one of the best experts over the over the ball again that's what gallon has been talking about all week is um being more competitive around the breakdown the lines just didn't get a grip on that area and the, the rock ball that the all blacks had in that first test was exceptional and um, speaking to someone involved with the kind of new zealand rugby scene they they had the stats and 
and the All Blacks kind of lightning quick ball is the term they use where the ruck is under three seconds was up around 70%, which is a massive, massive figure. Uh, you know, you'd be happy with 40% in any no normal game. They got incredible ruck speed. And for the Lions, being able to cope with that was literally impossible in that game. You saw the first try. The Lions went through about 15, 16 phases of consistent lightning quick uh, ruck speed against them. They're retreating. They're trying to make tackles. And eventually, they, they give up a penalty. There's still 10 seconds between the penalty and the quick tap from Aaron Smith. But you, the Lions were out in their feet. You see all the guys leaning over, hands on their knees. So they simply have to slow down that breakdown. I think Sean O'Brien did a decent job of trying. And speaking to, to him today, he was a bit frustrated that he didn't get more reward there. Um, but by bringing in Warburton, you're bringing in an absolute specialist in that area. Um, and It's probably a bad example game to use. But even if you look back at that Barbarians match, the first game on tour, there were four breakdown turnovers in that game. Warburton didn't get any one of those himself, but he actually assisted on all four. He, he's always in around that area. He's so intelligent. His decision-making is really strong. Um, and he definitely, for me, is going to improve them in that area of the game. The Lions probably lose a line-out option and other things with Peter Romani, but for that specific role, there's probably no better man than Warburg. Yeah, yeah. Moving on to the rest of the rest of the team selection, rather. Obviously, the, the big call here is uh, going with Johnny Sexton. It's, it's a bit of a turnaround. Well, Johnny Sexton at 10 and Owen Farrell at 12, but it is a bit of a turnaround from a few months back when there was kind of no certainty that Sexton would even be included in the squad, or at least based on Gatlin's quotes at the time. Yeah, I mean, he kind of challenged him. Gatlin's never afraid to challenge a guy and put a bit of heat underneath him. Um, and it was around Johnny Sexton's durability, and he's probably managed to show that, and he's getting through his tour quite well, and actually playing a lot of minutes has, has helped him play himself into form. Um, you know, coming into the tour, I think a lot of people probably expected to see this 10-12 combination between Farrell and Sexton, and certainly the All Blacks expected to see that. I think Hansen uh, thought it might come in the first test as well. And for me, I actually thought they should have gone that way in the first test. Uh, ben Teo, he's obviously a, an athletic specimen. He, he's really powerful on the gain line. But I just think you get much more um, playmaking intelligence, good decision-making, good passing ability when you have those two uh, guys at 10 and 12. And you saw, like last weekend's test, the key moment for the Lions was when they were, after halftime, they counter-attacked down the left. Uh, they're trailing 13-8, but the all are kind of on the ropes. And Ben Teo doesn't pass. You know, there was... Two guys outside him, Sean O'Brien and Falatau, and you could see their reaction. They were very frustrated. Um, and you have to have those players who can put, put that ball into space at those key moments. Um, on top of that, the weather conditions aren't going to be great in Wellington this weekend, according to the forecast. And now you have two kicking options in midfield. I think that's going to be really important because the, the, the Lions came out with 40% of the territory in that first test, and they just didn't play in the right areas. I think they're going to kick a lot more. Only 19 kicks, I think, in the first test when they've averaged around 26 uh, previously. So I think you get both those things. You get a, an additional kind of set of hands and playmaking and eyes as well as that kicking option. Yeah, well, with all of that being said, though, you surely have to try this axis in a game where you don't actually need to win for the future of the Lions franchise and for this test series. I mean, barring a kind of, uh, I suppose, a, a short enough cameo, we haven't really seen it in action. Yeah, I think we saw the 50 minutes against Crusaders was really promising. I think we would have seen it in the Mary game, uh, only for Owen Farrell to kind of pull up with that tie strain. So we probably would have seen another 30 minutes there maybe. Um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a huge risk. And it's a risk that kind of goes against what, what Warren Gatlin has really stood for. He's always picked that kind of gain line merchant at the, in the kind of 12 shirt at inside center. He's always gone that way. And now in the biggest game of his career back home in New Zealand where he's so eager to kind of impress New Zealand rugby and show them that he is a world-class coach. He's gone with something that's out of character for him. Um, like Personally, I think it's a good decision, but you're absolutely right. It's a big risk, and if it backfires, well, he's, he's going to be taking all the flack for that. Yeah, you mentioned how, I suppose, both men's proficiency with the boot might point to, towards a more territorial approach from the Lions. Do you, do you see that coming? Because I suppose... One of the issues with selecting uh, Farrell at 12, even though he is a, a big, strong, burly lad himself, you are losing some of that gain or ability to break the gain line in, in Benteo, who was probably the Lions' best runner in the back line before Liam Williams went nuclear and Jonathan Davis started, uh, started getting through, lads. So do you reckon now that that kind of points towards a, a different tactical approach from Gatlin? This was something we spoke with, um, or with Eddie O'Sullivan about during the week. He kind of couldn't really pinpoint where the Lions could change it, but maybe it is just about pinning them back into the corner. 
Yeah, I think we'll see more long kicking. I think they kicked well contestably off Conor Murray, but there were like relatively few times where they kind of found grass deep in, in behind the All Blacks. And I think they'll look for a bit of more a bit more of that. Johnny Sexton does that particularly well with those kind of low spirals into the corner. You mentioned there uh, Farrell's kind of ability on the gain line as a ball carrier. It'll be interesting to see what happens defensively as well. And I think that's where a lot of people have kind of concerns about this 10-12 axis. Sonny Bill Williams, he's going to be coming for them. You know, Anton, An- Anton Leonard Brown was interviewed today. We, we spoke to him at the All Blacks press conference and he said, potentially that's an area we're going to look to expose. Basically saying, we're coming for you, Johnny, and we're coming for you, Owen Farrell. Um, they're going to run hard down that channel all day. The two, the two guys are pretty good defenders individually, and they're both very fiery kind of characters. Interestingly enough, they both tackle very high. So if you're trying to look to stop that offloading game from Sunnyvale Williams, it could come in handy that they both like to wrap up high. Um, having said that, if you go too high on Sunny Bill, you're going to get smashed into the ground. You know, he'll sit anyone down with his power. Um, but I actually I, I wouldn't have as much concern over the defence um, as many would. I think the two of those guys are really good at... Uh, reading defensive situations and that's something else Gallon has spoken about about getting that line speed up and actually closing down Sonny Bill Williams before he has that chance to to maybe fr- uh, use his footwork and free the free the hands and um, but it's definitely it's definitely a big challenge and like they're going to get a, a greater test of their defensive um, fortitude than they ever have before I think yeah the other main uh, bone of contention I think with selection is the the inclusion or re-inclusion of Alan Wynne Jones I think a controversial selection for the first test himself there was maybe a perception perception from some people that he's a great leader and he, he'd had a decent tour, but I I failed to see anything he did in the first test that would warrant his inclusion, even over George Cruz, who didn't have a great game himself, but was probably a, a more standard performer over the tour in general. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think uh, Warren Gallen has made a mistake here. Um, I think it's a case of backing a player who he knows very well um, over someone who's informed, someone like Courtney Laws. Um, it looks like he made this decision early because Courtney Laws played 54 minutes on Tuesday. Obviously, George Cruz came on from in that game and Ian Henderson even went, went for the 80, barring his 10-minute spell in, in the sin bin. So I think he, he backed um, Adam Wynne-Jones very early in the week. I agree. I thought he was very poor in that first test. He, he seemed to take a bit of a knock in the head, I think, around the 17-minute mark and Maybe that had a slight effect on his performance, but he just didn't add any impact. He he knocked the ball on at key times, um, and I thought his set piece work wasn't as strong as usual. His his mauled, his mauling work just slightly off and lacking a little bit of accuracy, a little bit of aggression we've seen from him in the past. Gallen said before the first test, "I'm basically backing this guy because I know he'll he'll deliver when he's under pressure." And just today he said the same thing again. You know how many chances does a guy get? I think um, Mario Toje was always going to come in. And he had so much energy. Um, he was one of the guys, one of the few guys making dominant hit, dominant hits in that first test. But for me, uh, it's a mistake to start Alan Wynne Jones again. He's backing his experience. This guy's been through a, a test series and won with the Lions before, and captained even in that third test in Australia. But I just think it's a, it's a coach under pressure and um, going to a player he knows, and we've seen that lots of times. Um, not working out and I, I do fear that it's going to be the same again here yeah I think uh, we're, we're probably all fearing the same one coach under probably a slightly less pressure is Steve Hansen he's extended the olive branch I believe to his old foe uh, last night or this morning depending on where in the world you are yeah his old mate his old mate Gaddy um, yeah he's kind of called for an end he uh, had a bit of a go at the New Zealand Herald for their uh, cartoon clown character of, of Gatland um, and he said you know I respect this guy it's unfair that he's being ridiculed personally I think everyone agrees with that even the New Zealand Herald have since published a piece kind of uh, backtracking and, and almost apologizing I don't think they'll go there and um, but yeah it's good to see that kind of stuff out of the way like you know it's been a bit of a trudge it, you know it's your job to kind of cover that stuff and when coaches are having a bit of a snipe it's a bit of fun as well um, but it's nice to kind of shut that storyline down now and, and focus on the rugby. And there was a lot of chat of, of the actual rugby now. And, and both coaches, you could sense, were trying to figure out which way the other one's going to go. How do, how do the All Blacks attack this time? How are the Lions going to defend against that directness we saw the, the last time out? So, yeah, it's good that the two boys are mates again. I think they're going to share a beer after the Test Series. Lovely, heartwarming stuff. Uh, <laughs> looking ahead to the Test itself. <laughs> What, what's the mood like in the Lions camp? Um, I suppose we, we've probably heard enough from Gatlin at the moment. You mentioned he's under pressure. The players 
for them it's a, it's a bit of a difficult one in the sense you're staring into a test that surely in the back of my, your mind you know it's unlikely you're going to pull off a victory and yet you, you sort of have to believe as Eddie O'Sullivan was saying to us midweek that you can uh, what, what are the players like at the moment? Yeah, that's that's very much the the sense from them. Like they, like rugby players are so good at looking at the little things they missed, the the missed chance maybe there early in the second half, and um, even the first two minutes when Elliot Daly nearly got in, uh, they don't they don't buy into this um, kind of team. I guess that the All Blacks are are so much better than them. They think there was slight little errors in the performance that they can iron out. But like we talk about a coach under pressure, but for me, like beyond the tactical battle and the collective thing. This is a, such a huge game for those individual players. Guys like Johnny Sexton, who here in this game can create a bit of a legacy and, and, and kind of stamp his name all over the world game where he maybe isn't as respected outside Ireland as he is in Ireland. Uh, guys like Owen Farrell, you know, Lord is one of the best players in the world and pretty poor in the first test. A guy like Mario Toje, one of the best forwards in the Northern Hemisphere, we say, but the All Blacks and, and the rest of the world have, have probably yet to see that. So I think Alan needs those individuals, those leaders, um, probably to play a match of a lifetime it's, I think it's going to take that much because this All Blacks team uh, for me is probably going to go up another level um, from what we saw in the first test I think they've only played two tests together this year obviously so I think they're going to have their best performance yet and definitely for me guys like Sexton having been back now Alan Wynne Jones as we said they need to absolutely play um, out of their skin if, they're, if the Lions are going to pull this off Yeah for sure uh, going back actually to selection briefly I think one of the standard performance against the Hurricanes was probably Ian Henderson and were you surprised that he wasn't included in the match squad obviously I think most of the talk was that Courtney Laws was going to get in and then you're sort of thinking Henderson might miss out but he was very explosive and the Lions seemed to lack that at least from the pack in the first test yeah his ball carrying was unbelievably um, explosive as you say kind of run, run through Brad Shields uh, in the second half there just to remind everyone how mobile he is and I thought his handling, even for the assist for George North's try, was, was really good. Yeah, he's definitely massively unfortunate. I think when he went the, f the full distance in that game, you probably feared for him. And Gallen has really focused on that yellow card. He's mentioned it a few times now how disappointed he was how that swung the game, um, which is a little bit unfair. I mean, anyone can get in that situation, an unlucky situation in a ruck where you're just a slight bit in inaccurate with your, with your clear out. Um, they did also mention they nearly went for a 6-2 split on the bench. Um, they thought long and hard, especially with the weather conditions, about having an extra forward there. Um, and I think if that had gone that way and they had the 6-2, I think Ian Henderson would have had a really good chance of, of featuring there, possibly. Uh, it looked very unlucky. Uh, and if he had just timed that run of form a little bit earlier and started the tour with a bang rather than a really poor performance against Barbarians, I think he'd probably be in that squad. Um, his hope, I guess, is that he's, he's on that next tour in, in South Africa and making a big impact there. For sure, just uh, to get some comments in and questions, uh, Shane Keevney here goes back to Gatlin versus Hansen. He says, I think it's very unfair by the Herald to compare Gatlin to a clown. If I was a clown, I'd be livid with the comparison. Uh, but we do have a question from Don O'Sullivan of the Limerick Leader. He says, will the Lions defence be able to cope with Barrett at 10 for the full 80 minutes? Good question, Don. A great tactical mind in, in the rugby game. Um, I think that's a really val a really important point, actually. I think the Lions almost got away with it a little bit in that first test when, when Bowen Barrett went back to 15. Aaron Cruden's a, obviously a great out half, but he's nowhere near that level that um, Bowden Barrett has, has attained in the last year. Um, I would fear for the for the Lions' defence up against that challenge. Bowden Barrett is so good, and you saw it early in the game. He's so good at getting flat to the game line. He may have a, an inside passing option, an outside option. And he has that dart of acceleration that just makes it a nightmare for those two defenders to make a decision. He's also got that short kicking game, uh, which is something we, we should touch on here. We didn't see that in the first test. The, the, the All Blacks went for a different kind of attacking game plan than we had anticipated, than Warren Galland had actually anticipated. He expected a lot more of those chips, rubbers, the kick passes. And I think we're going to see those um, in this test because the Lions have to uh, shore up around those fringes and slightly kind of narrow their defence, and there's going to be more of that kicking space. Uh, they're going to try and come forward even harder because they just didn't get that line speed in the first test. And Barrett is the man who can who can expose that. I, 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 for the Lions, they're they're hoping they can shut him down, obviously. But I, I do fear for them that he's going to be having that kind of Dan Dan Carter 2005 performance. I think that's in him. And speaking to his coaches in the Hurricanes, they very much think that performance is in him as well in the second test. That sounds absolutely terrifying. 
uh, which means um, we might leave you with, with a couple of questions with regards to predictions. Uh, Donald Peoples asks, can the Lions win on Saturday? And if so, how? Ed Renison asks, is there anyone who really thinks this Lions team can win besides Stuart Barnes? I haven't, yeah, I haven't actually asked Barnsley for a prediction yet this week, but uh, he seems confident enough. Um, look, I, I can't see them win the second test. I couldn't see them win the first test. There's always optimism, and especially when you're here in the bubble and you're listening to the players talk about how close they were. But um, I just you try and get your head out of that and just remember that this is a team that literally came together a few weeks ago um, and is still trying to find that cohesion, still trying to find that finishing edge even when they create opportunities. And they're up against one of the greatest teams of all time. I think you saw in that first test, even with the All Blacks not quite at their best, even though they were physically brilliant, the speed of thinking is just on another level. And um, when they get a little flash of an opportunity, they're so quick at reacting. Even off that scrum, you know, Kieran Reed flicks it up off the ground, really good handling and a great finish in the, in the corner. And I just don't see how, even with all the tactical elements that the Lions are going to build in, they can uh, nullify that kind of stuff in the game. I just think they're playing against. Uh, better rugby players and I think actually the margin might even be a, a small bit bigger in this test well Murray uh, on that dour note thanks very much for joining us uh, enjoy the rest of the week enjoy the second test and we'll speak to you soon we'll speak to you after that um, after that test in Wellington but that is all we've got time for on the rugby show on the 42.ie uh, until Saturday it's going to be a long couple of days I'd imagine but until then take it easy <laughs>